All right, let's get uh, started. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Sebastian Pirouz. I'm a research professor working with the Central Jack Program at the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University. Uh, welcome everyone to our Central Asia program seminars. Uh, so today uh, we're going to address a very understudied topic, which is the role of Kazakhstan as a foreign donor. Uh, well, most of the research and most of the debates have focused on Western donors or on Russia, or on China, and on the increasing role of uh, emerging countries in the South, such as uh, India or Brazil as foreign donors. And yet, uh, we've seen this last 10 years or so how uh, Kazakhstan has been increasingly engaged uh, in development abroad. So this event today uh, is based on a book entitled Modernity, Development and Decolonization of Knowledge in Central Asia, Kazakhstan as a Foreign Aid uh, Donor. Uh, the book has been published uh, recently, very recently, and is authored by Nafisa Insebaeva. So I'm very, very happy to welcome Nafisa today in our seminar. I must say that I'm all, I'm very proud because Nafisa was one of our Central Asia Azerbaijan fellows at the Central Asia program a couple of years ago. So Nafisa uh, specializes in Kazakhstan's foreign policy, international development politics, foreign aid, and South-South cooperation. She holds a PhD from uh, the University of Tsukuba in Japan, and she currently serves as a researcher at the Nippon Foundation Central Asia Japan Human Resource Development Project. And uh, Nafisa studies have been uh, published in many peer reviewed journals, including the Journal of Eurasian Studies and Europe Asia Studies. So uh, Nafisa is going to present her book briefly. There about 15, 20 minutes, then uh, her presentation will be followed by two discussants, uh, Sinat Sultanaliyeva and Sofia Duboulet. And after uh, the discussion, we'll have a Q&A session. So please feel free to send your questions uh, in the chat box. So uh, thank you uh, so, so much, Nafisa, Sinat, and Sofia for being with us today. And Nafisa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian, for the gracious remarks. Um, if I can ask uh, Marhabo to share my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, so once again, thank you for the, for the introduction. Um, I, I can skip that part. I'm happy to get reunited with the Central Asia program and the IRS for the book launch. Uh, thank you for your constant support and for hosting this talk. Uh, so first of all, I would like to greet everybody who joined us today. Good morning if you're based in North America and good evening. In fact, late night if you are uh, joining us from Asia, it's midnight here. Uh, it is a pleasure and honor uh, for me to have this opportunity to discuss my book with all of you. Um, also, I would like to thank our discussants, Sinat and Sophia. I really appreciate your thoughts on this study. Um, before I dive into the details, I want to thank Paul Grave Macmillan for producing this work. And I would like to highlight the Politics and History in Central Asia book series at Paul Grave. I know that a lot more interesting and exciting research on Central Asia is going to come out this year. So I hope that you all will check those works out as well. Now, moving to the book itself, I think I'd like to start with talking a little bit about the genesis of the study, which is really my curiosity about the incredible transformation of development assistance, which was really what made me pursue this research in the first place. And uh, we all are familiar, I think, uh, at least broadly speaking, with uh, the concept of foreign aid, which emerged in the aftermath of the World War II. However, decades have passed since uh, its first conception, and the very nature of development assistance has been undergoing significant changes. In recent years, for example, there has been a flood of studies, as Sebastian mentioned, on the so-called established versus emerging donors strategic competition, which I will get to in a second. And some actors have been subjects of much 
academic scrutiny. For instance, again, the infamous so-called large Southern bilaterals, the BRICS countries, uh, with their uh, distinct approaches to development cooperation. Uh, in other words, we have been observing a rise of new development actors, new development institutions, and new development strategies, which all poses uh, a lot of questions on the implications of these challenge changes for the regional and international development landscape, which we can confidently argue has become increasingly policentric over the past several decades. And despite this trend, however, the research in the field of development cooperation is yet to examine the full diversity of emerging actors entering the foreign aid scene. And while some of these new providers have been um, under the spotlight, as I've mentioned before, others have uh, often been left aside. And as a result, there remains a vacuum of knowledge um, informed by fieldwork regarding these not less important cohorts of uh, second tier providers. And the case of Kazakhstan exemplifies the point. So with this kind of backdrop, this book joins the, uh, the discussion on foreign aid triggered by the rise of multiplicity of emerging donors in international development and explores the transformation of Kazakhstan from a recipient country to a development aid provider. If I can have the next slide. Uh, so this book is really the first uh, major piece of research that has been published on Kazakh aid. And this study is in part about how Kazakhstan constructed its development aid model, and it also evaluates its philosophy and core features, as well as explains the factors that account for the construction of Kazakh aid patterns, uh, but about this uh, later. First, I want to uh, mention that the book draws in the field work, which was conducted in Nur Sultan and Almaty between 2016 and 2019. So as you can imagine, it was a really long process, um, which involved a wide range of stakeholders. So because of the limited information available to the public on the topic to begin with, um, I cannot proceed without acknowledging the role of all cooperating governmental and non-governmental agencies. It would not be possible to complete this research without their kind cooperation. Uh, now, before we move on, uh, it must also be acknowledged that Kazakhstan's aid model uh, continues to undergo significant changes and the construction of its development aid model remains a continuous process. So let's look over the main developments. So according to the official rhetoric, Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan has provided over 500 million US dollars in foreign aid over the last 30 years. And we must acknowledge that Kazakhstan has made a relatively fast transition from a recipient of assistance to an international donor. And Kazakhstan's path, as you can see, to donorhood has officially commenced back in 2013, when the concept of the Republic of Kazakhstan in the sphere of official development assistance was approved by the decree of the president. And that was sort of the document ought to set the roadmap for uh, the state's development aid initiative. Uh, the Kazakh national system of ODA was established under the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Kazakhstan with the operating budget of 0.01% of GDP uh, for the purpose of providing development assistance primarily to the countries in uh, Kazakhstan's immediate neighborhood, so Central Asia and Afghanistan. Uh, Kazakhstan became the first official development assistance provider in the cent Central Asian region by adopting the law of the Republic of Kazakhstan on official development assistance on December 10th, 2014. Um, now in 2017, Kazakhstan announced the decree on main direction of state policy in the field of ODA for the years uh, from two, 2017 to uh, 2020. And uh, the next major development was the establishment of uh, Kazakhstan's uh, Agency for International Development, or Kazaid, uh, which was established by the decision of the government of Kazakhstan on December 15th, um, 2020. Uh, the agency was established as a mechanism for systematizing official development assistance in Central Asia. And the government described Kazaid as seeking to position itself as the main body for overseeing the flow of um, aid supplies provided to the Central Asian countries to allow for more effective management of those resources. And the Kazakhstan government intends for the agency to be a critical tool for promoting Kazakhstan's foreign policy objectives and maintaining regional stability. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? 
Uh, so now the question is, how has Kazakhstan's ODA been studied so far? And uh, as I mentioned before, first of all, it hasn't been studied much, but some existing work still need to be acknowledged. And Kazakhstan's development assistance has been primarily and solely, in fact, look at, looked at through the rationalist lens, which dictates that Kazakhstan uses its bilateral and multilateral relations in terms of foreign assistance to grow its political and economic leverage and that it uses this diplomatic and fi financial influence to try and advance its foreign policy objectives and outcomes to the extent possible. Uh, so in other words, the current discussion hyper focuses on Kazakhstan's self-interest and related aims it might wish to pursue through this initiative, which is again the result of the widely accepted conceptualization of foreign aid as a foreign policy tool. In this line, we have one of the explanations, for example, which dictates that by reducing and eliminating problems that have arisen from uh, underdevelopment in a neighboring countries, Kazakhstan aims to prevent penetration of these problems inside its own state. So we're talking illegal migration flows, drug trafficking, and other forms of crimes, including, including extremism and terrorism. It has also been argued that Kazakhstan ODA is ultimately connected to the increasing redefinition of power balances and sphere of influence, uh, influence in the region. And um, from this perspective, donorhood could possibly help Kazakhstan gain more influence in the neighboring states through its engagement and increase its bargaining power opposite its foreign aid dependence. Um, we've also seen some people look at the soft power dimension of aid, which uh, conceptualizes foreign aid as solidarity, arguing that with the economic development and growth of the international prestige of the country, the responsibility of Kazakhstan for ensuring international regional security and stability also increases. All in all, the existing literature on Kazakh aid, as you can see, aims to address the question why and focus on describing the motivations behind Kazakh aid. Now, even though all these explanations might be plausible, they evoke more questions than answers. And I think because we get so caught up in the exclusively focusing on this question, we lose track of the fact that, as I've briefly discussed before, the world is engaged in a diversity of foreign aid actors. Um, that's what has been ignored so far is the vital question of how Kazakhstan made this transition and uh, what's uh, Kazakhstan's identity as a donor. Therefore, this book aims to fill this gap and shift the discussion uh, by exploring how Kazakhstan transformed into the development actor it is today and what kind of development actor it is now. Next slide, please. So um, what do I mean when I refer to different kinds of development actors? Um, as I mentioned before, the development architecture revolves around the infamous dichotomy of traditional or established or old or Northern uh, and emerge new Southern donors. And the foreign aid landscape has witnessed an increasing diversification in donorship triggered by the rise of these non-DAC emerging Southern new donors. And these labels have often been used as a shorthand to set those new actors apart from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, Development Assistant Committee. DAC members, who are often referred to as uh, established donors, traditional donors, or Western Northern donors. Uh, despite its relatively wide usage, um, these categorizations of such actors as new or emergent uh, is actually quite imprecise. Um, first, uh, as many of you might know, many of these new emerging actors are not novices in the field of development assistance. Um, the greatest example would, be, would probably be China, which is considered to be an emerging donor, but whose uh, first aid giving activities date back to 1950s. Second, these umbrella terms misleadingly entail a connotation of um, homogeneity among the new development aid providers and disregard substantial differences among them. This divergence in views and practices is not exclusive to the so-called non-traditional donor group, in fact, established uh, donors, the DAC donors too lack homogeneity and often um, differ in the way they organize their aid and prioritize its purposes, which is evident from the multiple attempts to coordinate and harmonize their aid given activities and practices. Next slide, please. So the question now is, um, where does Kazakhstan fit in all of this? 
And while I argue that Kazakhstan has constructed a hybrid identity as a development aid partner, and that Kazakhstan doesn't fit either of, the, of these categories, and in fact stands as an outlier falling outside of these groups due to its historical experiences. And there are several reasons why Kazakhstan makes an interesting case study. Uh, first, Kazakhstan, as well as other uh, Soviet Republic, was not an independent member of the global system at the time of the first, second, third world classification, and hence wasn't categorized as a, as a third world country when the term was first coined. And these categorizations, the global north, global south, developed, developing the first world, the third world countries lie at the core of theorization about north-south and south-south aid paradigms. So this book aims to emphasize that these concepts were developed out of uh, an entirely different range of historic and geohistoric experiences. And given the socio-political and cultural differences between Western and post-Soviet societies, we cannot assume that the methodological tools and theoretical perspectives developed in the Western or sometimes non-Western context are necessarily applicable to Kazakhstan. Uh, in fact, the unique experience of such countries as Kazakhstan and uh, the sort of inability of the Cold War terminology to convincingly and thoughtfully capture and conceptualize these experiences highlight the outdated nature of those concepts, which do not seem to be relevant at the present time. Uh, so the point here is to show that Central Asian experts uh, and researchers should not blindly apply theories and concepts that, so to speak, did well in the West or, or other parts of, of the non-Western world, and uh, which got cemented in our heads. But I invite all of you to question the status quo respectfully and thoughtfully, and we definitely see some effort in that direction in the recent years. Um, so wrapping up this discussion, I should reiterate that there are inconsistencies that experts in the field should be uncomfortable with and the dichotomous approach to analyzing the international development architecture is too simplistic of a view to capture the full complexities of the existing mechanisms. Um, I think that because we often think of the rise of new development actors within the framing of their rivalry with the established donors for global influence, we downplay the significance of their diversity and their differences among each other. Um, and this can reduce our understanding of the international development landscape and architecture as a whole, and our understanding of the areas and the degree of their influence in particular. And I think that gives us Central Asian researchers um, sort of a, a reason to pause reflect on some of these misperceptions and misconceptions about our region and um, think about how we should approach this in a better way. I think we should uh, confidently repeat again and again that um, people in, living in Central Asia and in this case in Kazakhstan in particular and the choices that these people make will be crucial to the regional and potentially international development in the future. So in other words, uh, in other words, we have agency over our own narratives and discourses, and we shouldn't be afraid to um, decolonize the knowledge in Central Asia. Um, I think I will stop here and give the discussants the opportunity to, to the opportunity sh to share their thoughts, and I will be happy to answer some questions and comments after that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nafisa, for this uh, very clear and extremely interesting presentation in your book. So now, indeed, as you said, we have uh, two discussants. We'll start with uh, Sophia Duboulet, who is a Mary Curry Fellow and PhD candidate in political science at uh, Oxford Brookes University. Uh, Sophia works on authoritarian regimes, including their political stability and legitimation in Central Asia and the Caucasus. And her research has been published in uh, uh, problems uh, in, a, in the journal Problems of Communism and in a volume edited by Rico Isaacs and Alessandro Frigero. Uh, and the book has a volume, the edited volume is entitled Theorizing Central Asian Politics, the State Ideology and Power, which was published by Petrograd Macmillan in 2019. So, Sophia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Peros. Uh, thank you, Nafisa, for inviting 
me and thank you to all my fellow panelists for organizing these events and to the audience for listening to us. So um, Nafisa's book explores the multi-layered discourses and politics uh, pertaining to the development aid in Kazakhstan. As we know, previous literature on modernization and development in Central Asia focused predominantly on failed attempts uh, to democratization, mega events, and the changing landscapes of urban infrastructure. And also, as um, Professor Peyros and Nafisa herself mentioned, the subject that was indeed neglected uh, emerging donors in the from the developing developing global north like Central Asia. Mm. So uh, Nafisa aims to explain how Kazakhstan uh, emerged as a um, development cooperation uh, provider by focusing on norms, practices, and discourses. I think it's an incredibly engaging and empirically rich uh, study that deconstructs institutional, legal, and historical foundations for development aid in Kazakhstan since independence. And I recommend uh, all of you to read the book. Methodologically, as Nafisa explained, it's based on her fieldwork research for three years. I wasn't quite sure how many interviews did you conduct, uh, Nafisa, for this um, project, but um, she collected interviews with high-ranking officials, diplomats, and experts in the field. So as you understand by now that Kazakhstan became a pioneering state in uh, official development assistance in Central Asia, securing its leading position as it likes in the region, a government adopted a new policy concept and um, created various institutions but um, it seems like uh, since 2017, there was this impetus um, to uh, um, widen uh, soft power uh, influence uh, from Kazakhstan abroad uh, due to domestic stability, due to strong statehood and uh, so-called self-reliant economy. And um, my first question to Nafisa will be why 2014 became uh, such a special uh, historical juncture for Kazakhstan uh, to um, start this project on development aid, especially considering, as you write, that uh, in 2015, Kazakhstan took a loan of one million, a billion to US dollars from the Asian Development Bank. Uh, for different uh, programs to stabilize its domestic economy. So it seems like Kazakhstan wasn't in its best economic uh, position to start uh, to launch such a grant project. Uh, so that's the first question. So uh, it also was very interesting to look uh, and uh, see who are the architects of um, development aid project. And apart from Nazarbayev, we can see former foreign minister, Irlan, Irlan Idrisov, uh, who is a current ambassador to the UK. And uh, he thinks that uh, it was just natural uh, for Kazakhstan to become a um, foreign development partner because Kazakhstan already started being engaged in such kind of initiatives since mid 2000s. Um, well, official discourse highlights that um, development aid shouldn't be considered just as a charity, but rather as a foreign policy tool um, and moral obligation towards um, its regional neighbors, uh, less fortunate regional neighbors. And my second question will be about those um, regional neighbors. Uh, well, you mentioned this concept of hybrid donor identity, and I quite like it. And I think that's your original contribution to the study quite clearly. Mm. And how do you think Kazakhstan um, operationalized this uh, hybrid donor identity in relation to Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan? Um, well, I do understand in, uh, how it does this job for Afghanistan. I think you articulate that well in your writing, but I would like to know why this 
two countries were used as an um, example, and how this idea of good neighbor, neighborliness, as you call it, um, realized. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and my final question would be in relation to your one of your last chapters on Soviet modernization. And you argue that Kazakhstan learned quite well from the experience of being a um, foreign aid recipient during the Soviet time, especially in the field of education and how that uh, has um, quite serious, both positive and negative implications. So uh, I would like to know how to envision um, this kind of um, investment in educational field as a part of the greater uh, foreign development uh, program will impact uh, the region in the future. Um, well, I don't know if I use my time. Thank, Thank you. you <laughs> Thank you so much, Sofia. Uh, and so uh, I give the floor now to our second discussant, so, uh, who is Sinat Sultan Ali. Uh, uh, Sinat is a researcher at Human Rights Watch. Uh, she focusing on Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, and she received a PhD from the special program in Japanese and Eurasian studies at the University of Tsukuba. Uh, Sinat, her uh, academic interests lie at the intersection of gender studies and critical post-colonial theories, and Sinat has worked also extensively on LGBTI and women's rights uh, in Central Asia, helping in the establishment of uh, several initiatives uh, in the region. And before uh, Sinat starts, uh, I just would like to remind that please, uh, to our audience, please feel free to send your questions in the, in the chat box. Thank you. So, Sinat, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Um, uh, and thank you, Nafisa, for inviting as well uh, as a discussant uh, to your book launch. I'm really happy uh, to be part of it. Um, and uh, just to, I mean, uh, my contribution, I, I think, as a discussant is going to be a little bit shorter and more maybe uh, focused on the theory. I'm not so much of a, I mean, I don't have a, a background in uh, donor uh, theories and you know, studying donors or economics, finances and uh, other such things, which you are an expert in, Nafisa, and I take my hat, uh, hat down. <laughs> um, but at the same time, um, I understand why uh, I think, um, and I think it's a, it was a good idea, I'm really happy to be part of this discussion. Um, in terms of the theoretical uh, contribution of your book, uh, it really does uh, coincide with my personal, um, well, not personal, academic sort of interests. Um, and um, as you also know, I'm kind of looking into these uh, post-colonial uh, discussions, um, applying them to Central Asian context, um, except in a different, a little bit of a different uh, uh, sphere. Um, so, uh, and I immediately, of course, uh, saw some uh, intersections there, some overlapping um, ideas, even authors. Uh, I thought your book is uh, really very well written. Uh, so that's more like a <laughs> personal uh, reader kind of a review, I guess, uh, for your book, <laughs> as opposed to an academic, uh, very well written uh, stuff. But uh, I just wanted to maybe, um, highlight some of the things that I thought was, um, that, that I found really uh, great um, about how you approach this topic. And, um, and that has to do with uh, applying the concept of imagined communities, right, to the identities and like to having these collective identities for donors. I thought that was uh, quite um, ingenious uh, in that sense, um, especially the um, sort of like the joint um, identity of the new donors or the SSC. Uh, the South South Corporation uh, donors, um, even though they are still, as you're mentioning it, uh, and it, it is important to remember that they are still very much diverse um, and they don't really fit the sort of these narrow categorizations of the old North, um, kind of North to South uh, types of donors and then the new ones, the emerging uh, South South uh, ones. At the same time, we have to recognize that, you know, regardless of this. Uh, differences, there is still something that's kind of uh, 
um, uniting them uh, in that sense, right? Um, so I thought also uh, uh, it, um, another thing that um, I thought uh, was really well um, kind of um, touched in the book is um, uh, the idea of these eight philosophies um, of the, the, the different sort of groups, right, um, uh, of the donors. Um, and I was, uh, okay, excuse me. And I'm sorry about this. <laughs> um, so yes, um, so uh, I was talking about the eight philosophies, right? Um, the question about, um, and I, um, as sort of, um, Addressed in the in the title of the of the book as well as in the chapters, um, especially in the uh, theoretical background uh, for the book. Um, an interesting point is about uh, the sort of the colonialist undertones um, um, in the paradigm in the in the eight philosophies of the old and the established sort of like the OECD OECD uh, DAC uh, donors, right? Um, because we can clearly see how the um, sort of the, the donor um, or the grant for aid is, is kind of a lot of the times is uh, conditioned to uh, certain um, um, milestones, right, on the part of the receiving countries, um, and there is a lot of uh, tying of this to democratization, to the human rights, um, and we are seeing how human rights uh, or the paradigm of human rights is becoming a tool of this kind of new, uh, perhaps that's going to be maybe a very strong word, but of a new imperialism uh, in that sense, right? You, you know, you're going to get the money if you make sure that LGBT people in this country are you know, treated equally uh, with, without regards uh, uh, as to how exactly the situation, you know, the, the background, historical context, religious context of these countries. Um, this is a very contentious point, so I'm not making any kind of uh, uh, a claims there, uh, but it's just something interesting to think about, right? Um, uh, how um, so? How this? Uh, I would, I guess, say, sort of colonialist um, uh, paradigm is very much apparent uh, in these issues, and um, I'm also seeing myself uh, personally how uh, a lot of the time in human rights advocacy, uh, these uh, uh, these tools um, are employed. By the different um, actors within this um, uh, sphere, right, where um, uh, governments are being influenced by other governments or by people within these um, states, for example, um, and there are several um, different kinds of tools. So, for example, when we're talking about the, about the about the European uh, Union, let's say there's uh, always the uh, how's it called the European Partnership Cooperation Agreement or the so-called EPCA, which is also um, you know. A, Appeal to appeal to by the local human rights activists um, in their communication with the EU, for example, um, as you know, you should withhold this the signing of this unless there is um, some uh, progress made um, on the ground. Um, and how um, how to approach the how to approach this uh, issue? Uh, I guess academically, uh, I think that's an interesting topic. And I was just wondering, what do you think about this? And how I mean, you did um, mention this, um, you know, the different sort of um, philosophies of the new uh, or like the south south where i'm also sort of guessing there is the um, sort of there's less strings attached or perhaps even if the strings attached um, are attached then they would be attached to different topics and um, i'm guessing so <laughs> uh, that would be something interesting for me to to learn uh, about on i mean your thoughts uh, on this issue um, and another thing that i thought um, another question that i think would be interesting for us um, to think about collectively, but also, first of all, um, your opinion on this uh, issue um, is uh, in light of the January events from recent, so basically from this year, 2022, right? And we are all understanding or we're now having, or maybe not so much now, but I, I guess it's coming more into light of the public sort of conscious uh, or the public uh, paradigm discourse in general. Um, and it, it has been um, discussed and raised, uh, you know, maybe in academic, but like more in the niche circles um, before. But now it's uh, more or less a general knowledge that um, a lot of the issues that had to do uh, with the January events is we saw that uh, there were masses of these disenfranchised youth 
um, um, you know, an overwhelming majority of whom were uh, young males uh, who are unemployed, uh, who are not within any sort of networks or circles. Uh, basically, uh, God, the only word that, that comes to my mind is new in Russian, uh, in Russian. Right? So there is no uh, kind of outlet uh, for their for anything, right? And then it's a lot easier to be manipulated for them or to be engaged in uh, criminal or paralegal activities or some such. So uh, considering that this has come to light, um, a question kind of uh, rises into how do you think will the ODA sort of policy of Kazakhstan, will it change uh, with this in mind? Especially considering that uh, from what I understand, there has been a For the People of uh, Kazakhstan fund that has been also created to address some of these issues, uh, I'm guessing. Um, so yes, um, your opinion on, on how these events will be influencing Kazakhstan's um, aid kind of uh, status. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sina. So maybe before moving to the discussion with our audience, I will let a bit of time, Nafisa, to, to answer the question. Do you want to react to uh, uh, Sophia and uh, Sina's comments, Nafisa? Uh, yes, please. Sure. Well, f first of all, thank you very much for your great comments. I, I didn't expect anything less. I think that both of you really brought your expertise into a review in my book, which makes me very, very happy. <clears throat> I think I will combine some of the questions in terms of, uh, in, in order to uh, not blabber on the same sort of topics uh, over and over again. Um, Sophia, you pointed out, um, so your question was about 2014 and why specifically that was the year when the law got adapted, uh, adopted and uh, Kazakhstan became the official uh, donor. And uh, it's actually really difficult to pinpoint a specific event that triggered um, the conception of the law and, and the even motivation of Kazakhstan to become an official development assistance provider in the first place because there were, there were actually a series of events over uh, years. Um, and um, I, I actually discussed these, um, I think in the sort of at the end of my book where I mentioned Nazarbayev's speech and address to the people of Kazakhstan where he specifically states his opinion of aid. And he says uh, something along the lines of um, we shouldn't depend on it, and we should be an independent sovereign state. So you can already see uh, the shift of the mindset um, of the population, or you, you could say the government or the country, that it doesn't want to be uh, dependent on aid anymore and doesn't want to be a recipient of aid anymore. And then you have um, the prior commitments that Kazakhstan made to OECD back in 2008 and chairmanship, um, in other uh, international organizations. So it's really a list of events that all sort of multiplied and uh, resulted in what we can observe. And um, you, you rightly pointed out, so foreign minister, former foreign minister Idrisov, he specifically emphasized that this also should be seen as, a, as an attempt to systematize the already existing aid giving activities. So it's not like in 2014, Kazakhstan started giving aid. It, according to the official rhetoric, Kazakhstan continued to give aid that it had started giving uh, years prior. Um, in terms of the regional developments, so Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan specifically, and I think I can tie it to Sinan's question about the January events in, in Kazakhstan. And I think that um, both of those questions are related to the regional cooperation. And uh, they sort of point, especially the January events, point at um, the, the fact that building connection is the future and the politics of isolation, uh, isolationism and withdrawal is a futile path. And uh, in terms of uh, the finances, Sinat, you mentioned that you know the there were economic reasons for the protests. Um, you know, Kazaid is not simply about giving money, and the policymakers in Kazakhstan do not see it as a tool to just give distribute money abroad. 
but rather it's a strategically important tool for uh, Kazakhstan's foreign policy objectives regarding the region's long-term development. Uh, this is how Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan also play a role as area-specific powerhouses, for example, in specific areas of expertise. Um, so, for example, stabilizing the political and socioeconomic landscape, as well as preventing the aforementioned terrorism and uh, extre extremism in the recipient countries in the region as a whole. And then the idea of crafting um, a policy that we can implement around these issues is very complicated. It's very difficult to find sort of one answer to these questions. And if we take this um, as one of the many considerations that Kazakhstan must keep in mind, uh, we need to weigh it against other strategic objectives uh, that Kazakhstan might have in their, in, to, to pursue in the region. And, um, you know, the question is, what do you do when you face a, a real crisis, both at home and abroad or in your immediate neighborhood, right? And how should this factor in? Um, in terms of how we distribute uh, the, our foreign assistance and whom we give aid and how much we give. And um, I think this is something that we all, and by <laughs> we all, I mean scholars, policymakers, civil society activists need to weigh in on how we can build relevant, timely, effective strategies to address all of those issues. Uh, there's no simple answer to this question. Um, in terms of uh, Sophia's question regarding Soviet modernization project and how investment in education can impact regional development. Well, as I'm writing in the book as well, uh, politics definitely plays a role uh, in how aid is distributed and what projects are, are chosen. And, uh, you know, People have essentially been having a conversation around how, um, how this is an effective foreign policy tool. And we should recognize that the instrument that we are talking about is assistance, right? Which clearly has implication regarding the quality of our assistance and whether it's being adopted effectively or not. And uh, there are a couple of things to consider about um, effectiveness of our aid. And it's uh, first, an interesting question to keep in mind, I think, is about how increasing the political usage of aid can affect development effectiveness and development outcomes. So education is um, you know, often seen as less a controversial area of um, involvement. So uh, one of the projects that Kazakhstan uh, did in the region was concerning um, healthcare and education in terms of maternity, um, for, for mothers and sort of kids to uh, decrease uh, child mortality, which is a less politically sensitive issue than let's say corruption or democracy, right? So I think that that does um, give you a picture and, and an idea of how those projects are, are chosen and um, what this sort of the development trajectory of, of Kazakhstan is a, uh, uh, foreign aid donor provider uh, is. Um, Sinat's question or comment rather about imagined communities, that's uh, a very important question, I think. Thank you very much for it. So, uh, you know, when we see these words, oh, old, traditional, southern, northern, um, people tend to treat them as just uh, sort of late. Uh, useless hefty labels that we could just throw around to you know describe something in the distance but uh, those actually are carefully crafted and there is uh, the whole identity behind those words and uh, it's not only specific aid policies or aid strategies that um, that are the main root of the difference and diversity in uh, the development aid development aid but it's also the identity how donors identify themselves and how they identify their aid. And um, that ties to your second question about the colonialist undertones of aid or to aid. And uh, as I'm writing in my book, you know, for a lot of people, they, they conceptualize aid as the transfer of superior quote unquote Northern knowledge and expertise from the global north to the global south and they often see it as a you know a morally uh, good thing to do 
And, um, but other people would question that, right? Because we, aside from aid given activities, we have international institutions, we have international trade, and uh, a lot of people might say, well, you know, a lot of cheap labor, a lot of um, just exploitation happening in the global south that benefits the global north, right? Both economically and politically sometimes. So it's a very interesting question. I, I really encourage other Central Asian researchers to look into it because depending on the context, depending on the country we're looking at, the undertones and the implications of those undertones are going to be different, I believe. that This is what I'm arguing in my book, that Kazakhstan's experience is unique in that it doesn't fit either of those groups of uh, donor countries. And there is more diversity to emerging donors than meets the eye. Uh, so thank you for your questions. I hope I answered them. All right, thank you very much, Nafisa, for, I mean, all these comments on uh, uh, Sinat and Sofia discu uh, discussion. We're gonna move now to the discussion with uh, our audience. Uh, of course, uh, Sinat and Sofia, you're more than welcome to, to participate. Uh, so uh, first question, which is a theoretical question, uh, is uh, in your conclusion notes, Nafisa, you touched upon the necessity to uh, re-examine the lens through which Central Asia, and specifically Kazakhstan, needs to be examined theoretically, winding it to the necessity to decolonize the knowledge. So the question is, uh, to what extent comparative analysis with other uh, similar not Central Asian states may be useful to find those those lenses you're mentioning, or perhaps what alternatives do you suggest for Central Asian scholars to use when applying Western theories uh, into the region? Uh, thank you. This is a great question. Um, what I'm actually calling for is for Central Asian researchers to use the local knowledge, uh, which would I think more properly uh, capture the experiences that they're uh, having in all sorts of um, areas of life. And uh, even in terms of aid given activities, you know, aid is not something that um, in, in its core, right? It's not something that was coined in the West or like helping out countries in the, in, uh, the immediate neighborhood. It's not a concept that uh, was, uh, necessarily exported to us, right? Uh, we see, in fact, we see um, a lot of cultural traditions that correspond with those kind of activities. So I would actually urge Central Asian uh, researchers to question the West, the theories and concepts that emerged in the West and, and maybe were successful in the West in capturing those experiences and um, not fall to the trap of just blindly applying those tools because, well, you know, th that's what the dominative, dominant uh, narrative um, tells us to do. That, oh, if this worked in the West, if that worked in uh, the Western dominated context, then it should work in your region as well. And if it doesn't, then your research is bad. So I think this, this we should abandon this self-colonizing kind of syndrome that um, pro prohibits us from looking at our own experience from um, through the through our own lenses. So I would actually be interested in hearing, for example, Sina and Sophia on um, what they, some of their ideas are on how they uh, contextualize their research in terms of whether they <laughs> blindly <laughs> apply or just apply Western theories in their studies, or they're looking for something else that more properly captures our experience. Sinat, Sofia, do you want to add anything? I know Sinat probably. Uh, I'm more familiar with Sinat, Herbert research. Like <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know. I was going to joke to, and say that I am absolutely blindly applying. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. Uh, that's, why, that's why I, I phrased it that way. 
<laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, uh, no, but I absolutely agree with you that it, it is important to kind of um, to, uh, to look for um, like a diversification of approaches and, and, and outlooks on, um, on how, well, yeah, basically approaches on how we're uh, looking at um, issues of, and, you know, at, at the topics uh, in the, within the academia in general. And um, that's also something that I cover in, in my research, and I stand by it myself also personally, as academically and personally, that there is a need for this kind of um, um, a, a degrant narrativizing, um, you know, bastardizing Leotard uh, in a way. Uh, that you know, and, and the whole idea or the or the desire to keep on coming up with these grand theories and the grand narratives, which part of it is also this whole uh, division or like uh, putting everybody into these categories of old and new, global north and global south, and uh, all of that stuff. When in fact we're seeing that um, all of these uh, issues, like say countries, right, and um, like uh, when we're talking about your research. They are just escaping. There's no way of you know putting everybody into these boxes. Uh, they, there's something a limb is going to be always uh, you know protruding in a way, and there's just um, and we have to uh, um, accommodate this. And and I think one of the ways that we can do this is to move away from the uh, desire to put everything into the or to like um, yeah adapt everything to these um, grand narratives which have been already established for quite a while. And again. Do we have to question or like raise the, raise this again uh, here uh, on this platform? The, the, the whether whether this is really justified that we are constantly referring back to this again the, the European zero point of epistemology, right? Where we know that there is there is this one certain um, point of origin for how we approach things, uh, which is very objective, which is very rational, which is very I don't know. Let's, let's you know, there's many ways that we can describe this approach and. Uh, I'm not going to go into the whole cultural studies uh, tirade here, uh, but yes, definitely uh, agreed. And um, it is important, and, and that's why I think it's important that there is uh, this book that you uh, have published, and, and that, that also there is a, um, it's part of a series um, on, on, on history and politics and decolonizing history and politics in Central Asia and Central Eurasia, and hopefully all around the world. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of challenging these um, approaches. And then I guess I, I would like to actually... Uh, Including your myself. upcoming study, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, to correct myself, I mean, I think Central Asia specifically in that regard is probably one of the last to be covered um, or to be joining this uh, um, uh, sphere because we know how post-colonial theory and decolonial theory is very well developed and so it's, um, there, there is so much uh, that's already been done on um, other parts of the world, right? And Central Asia specifically, I think, has always been. And I think that's also very well put in, uh, in your um, book. Uh, it, it, it has to do with the whole idea of the first, first world, second world, and third world. And then once we have the collapse of the Soviet Union and all these formerly um, non-independent um, second world-ish countries, where do we put them? How do they, again, that's the issue of these protruding limbs or countries that just you know, defy uh, uh, categorizations that were established before, before their existence or sovereign existence. I mean, I guess a very like uh, an everyday kind of example of that is, you know, when us Central Asians, or I should say Kazakhs in particular, we always talk about how when we fill out forms, when we're traveling or something, and we need to answer the question about our race, and if there is no other, we're just confused. So, you know, it's just one of the examples of how we're left completely out of the ongoing discussion, we have to sort of navigate our way into fitting into a specific box that has been set out for somebody else you know so yeah i i, I encourage others to also check out your research which is forthcoming all right let's maybe move to uh, to the next question we we have just a few more minutes left so uh, a question would be, uh, what about the connections between uh, foreign aid and internal and uh, let's say clientelistic uh, goals? I mean, some research uh, has shown that a lot of European foreign aid directly benefits European companies or indirectly benefits them. So 
could you, is there a similar pattern uh, uh, in Kazakhstan? Could you say a few words on that, please? Uh, well, for now, Kazakhstan just started its development assistance initiatives in terms of like formalizing it, right? So in terms of what we can observe and the facts that are in front of us, uh, Kazakhstan's focus uh, in the regional development is primarily about security issues, uh, education, healthcare. So it's not so much about infrastructure or trade right, which um, are notoriously known for uh, different kinds of questions surrounding the purposes of aid and the, the tied nature of aid. So I would say from the projects that have been implemented so far, uh, the main, of course, Kazakhstan is pretty upfront about the fact that it wants to establish closer regional cooperation that does involve you know, uh, getting, uh, building closer ties in our supply chains and uh, building more partnerships in different areas. So potentially, potentially it could, be, it could benefit um, Kazakhstan, it could benefit other regional partners. But again, from what we can see now, um, from the projects that have been implemented, um, it's hard to argue that th there is this clientelism present at the present time. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from our audience is, why do you think Kazakhstan has established uh, the agency in the middle of the pandemic in August 2021? And why do you think there is almost no information available on Kazakh aid? On Kazakh aid, sorry. Um, well, you know, <laughs> the pandemic is probably doesn't seem like uh, a very great time for the establishment of development assistant agency. But I think that the ongoing crisis and the crisis that started in, I guess, early 2020 or late 2019, depending on where you are, it reaffirms the importance of regional cooperation and finding shared mutual solutions on the regional level. So uh, it, from, from this perspective, it's the perfect time because you know, it's the time when we all need to unite and uh, find solutions to very pressing difficult issues. And maybe we're stronger um, by building a partnership, a close partnership with each other. Um, and the second part of your question was why, why is there not enough information about it? Well. Again, I, uh, as I'm arguing in my book, um, I argued that Kazakhstan built a hybrid identity as a, as a donor. So it complies with some uh, policies that OECD DAC has set out. And at the same time, it has its own vision of um, what development means and how it should be done. So, and also there, there is a, an element of Kazakhstan being a new donor. So a lot of those processes are very new to Kazakhstan. So there are many, many reasons behind the availability of uh, reliable information, uh, which is why I think this book is um, very unique in that um, it's based on years of um, research and interviewing people who are directly involved in all of those projects uh, that were implemented within this framework. And I'm talking about um, everyone from Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, of Kazakhstan to uh, United Nations Development Program and uh, Japanese International Development Agency, so corporation, international uh, cooperation agency. So the stakeholders involved were interviewed and the findings are present in this book if you're interested. Uh, we're almost in the end, but I mean, I received some questions about uh, Afghanistan, and uh, you write in your book that one of the guiding principles of Kazakhstan's ODA distribution model is the principle of no political conditionality. Uh, regarding the fact that Afghanistan is the first uh, destination country of Kazakhstan ODA. What about the situation now that the Taliban took over the country again? Is this likely to drive Kazakhstan to reframe its policy or will Kazakhstan uh, stick to its policy of no political conditionality, including with, uh, uh, with the Taliban? 
And uh, still again, uh, still on Afghanistan, the second question is regarding so the aid brought to Afghanistan, is there any kind of coordination with other countries and especially with Russia or with other Central Asian countries? Uh, for example, uh, with Uzbekistan, which has brought some aid to Afghanistan. Uh, thank you for very good questions. In terms of um, whether the, the current situation in Afghanistan is going to change the tra trajectory of, of Kazakh aid, um, I think that, you know, Kazakhstan has been pretty clear that the main purpose of its aid um, is uh, capacity building initiatives and sort of in ensuring peace and stability in the country. So as long as uh, the partners in Afghanistan are open to uh, cooperation, are open to working together on uh, these capacity building initiatives and peace building initiatives. I don't see Kazakhstan intervening in the political affairs of Afghanistan, aside from maybe issuing some sort of recommendations. But, um, you know, Kazakhstan's identity as um, a hybrid donor is, uh, is that it, it's respectful of um, the sort of the domestic affairs that are happening in the partner countries. Uh, in terms of coordination of aid, um, that's a very difficult question because, you know, it's di difficult to speak on Uzbekistan because Uzbekistan doesn't um, provide much information about its aid. It doesn't report to <laughs> any official um, aid agencies. So it's really hard to tell. But again, within the framework, I guess the, the main the main goal of this initiative in the first place is to coordinate the regional um, initiatives and um, you know whether it's going to be a success a success or not um, time will tell but as of now this is what Kazakhstan aims to do is to coordinate all of those um, uh, aid given activities under Kazaid. Thank you uh, I, I mean maybe uh two questions to conclude on how, what Kazakhstan, I mean, is trying to build its own model of development. So uh, the two questions on how now actually this uh, Kazakhstan aid has been viewed. So the first question is, to what extent is Kazakhstan's population aware of their country engagement in uh, ODA? And how is that viewed or debated, for example, in newspapers? And the second question, uh, did you have a chance in your research to go through how Kazakhstan's ODA and its impact are viewed, debated in recipient countries? How this aid is compared, for example, with other donors who have been criticized, like, uh, let's say, the United States or the European Union? Uh, in terms of how the population sees it, um, you know, Kazakhstan has been trying to sort of uh, be very upfront and um, announce this initiative. And there are a lot of newspaper publications uh, about this, but in, I don't think uh, we have achieved the wide coverage. I don't think that an average person would know about these initiatives. Um, in terms of how it is debated, I, you know, I would have to conduct a, a separate research on the, on how aid is perceived by regular citizens. And unfortunately, I have not done so. Uh, from what I've seen, I've seen different things. I've seen people who, again, argue that it's a great foreign policy tool and can help Kazakhstan strengthen its position in the region. Uh, I've seen people say that, you know, we need to focus on our domestic issues first and, you know, we uh, there is no need to spend our money abroad. So um, there are contradicting opinions out there. Uh, in terms of uh, how Kazakh aid is seen in the recipient countries, this is actually the topic of um, my current research. So if you um, come back to me in a bit, will. I will be able to <laughs> will be able to answer this question in more detail. So thank you. It, it's it's a very important question. Thank you, Nafisa. Just before we conclude, uh, I'd just like to give uh, uh, Sofia and Sina a chance to add anything they want. Uh, just to go back to uh, Selbe's comment on which lenses can we use to uh, decolonize Central Asian studies, I want to say that we should be very careful with this trends of decolonization and some 
uh, in my research on uh, authoritarianism, I can see some universally um, applicable trends, both in Central Asia, in uh, Middle East, in Latin America, how authoritarian regimes behave. And I think that's a great way to, to look into those study and um, also share knowledge south to south or even uh, with India or BRICS countries. Um, Nafisa mentioned in her book. And another great trick would be to use, uh, be very sensitive to whom we reference in, in our studies. Um, and I became very <laughs> peculiar with that, um, acknowledging more local authors. But I think that since there is no shortage of uh, local great scholarship on Central Asia, we are very, um, we're living in a great time when we can quote each other. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you for this uh, great book. Tina, do you want to add anything? Um, not much, but I think I would just also really follow up on or like join into what uh, Sofia had mentioned, especially on the part of um, how Central Asian um, researchers specifically, but I wouldn't say it's only you know, limited to Central Asian researchers who are from Central Asia themselves, but also anybody else who is covering or who is interested in Central Asia, that it is important to uh, take note and to read and to acquaint yourself uh, with the works of um, scholars who are stemming from this or like or originating from this region uh, to kind of like, you know, again, yeah, um, be very specific and um, I guess purposeful uh, in, um, in this work. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really sorry we, we need now to conclude. So I'm sorry I couldn't take all the questions of the audience. So, but please, I mean, feel free to get in touch with uh, Nafisa. I mean, as you see, with all these questions, the many questions we, we received, I mean, Kazakhstan ODA is uh, a very important topic. It raises a lot of interest and to know more again about this topic. So I repeat, I very strongly recommend you read Nafisa's books entitled A Modernity Development and Decolonization of Knowledge in Central Asia, Kazakhstan as a Foreign Aid Turner, and which has been published by Pelgrave Macmillan. So thank you very, very much, Nafisa, for your uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Sinat and Sofia, for the discussion. I would also like to thank our audience for being with us today and for the discussion. And we look forward to having you again in one of our upcoming uh, seminars. So thank you very much. Have a good day or have a good evening. All for our colleagues in East Asia, including in Japan, have a good night. Thank you. Goodbye.